Good morning, and welcome to Clayland Baptist Church. It is good to see you, see you all in our worship service this morning. If you have your bulletin, just a few announcements I'd like to share with you. Uh, one of the things uh, we've, uh, look, there's been a lot of sickness going around, and uh, there was uh, quite a few that was, uh, that was sick this past week, and so what we had to do is... Uh, counsel our Wednesday night services and uh, so we were supposed to have business meeting last Wednesday night so what we're going to do is we're going to postpone that and move it to this coming Wednesday night so no keepers of the faith no youth this Wednesday uh, we will have um, a business meeting again in the overflow edition at 6 30 on Wednesday other than that everything else is is uh, pretty much regular for the week <clears throat> I will share with you that I will be having visitation this um, this Saturday at 2 o'clock here at the church, so I encourage invite you to be here for that. Uh, also, you have the church planners uh, listed there in, uh, in the uh, bulletin out in Ontario, so be in prayer for them as well. Also, for the Pregnancy Care Center, month of February, we always take up a love offering for them. And again, we ask that you use the offering envelopes in the pew ahead of you and just mark on their Pregnancy Care Center or PCC that we'll make sure that it gets into the right place. Also, um, one, one announcement, I realize that February, it, we're you know, kind of well into it already, but one thing that I uh, failed to do last week was um, uh, talk about the flowers. And uh, my wife, Dee Dee, she is the one that uh, was responsible for the flowers for the month of February. So uh, thank you to her for that. So um, I don't know who has March. March, where March? Oh, Miss Sandra's got March. All right. So there you go. Looking forward to that. So, um, all right. Any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Anybody? I will give you an update on Brother Lauren. Uh, as many of you know, that he had a, a detached retina, and uh, he has um, uh, gone in and, and had the surgery, and he is uh, doing better. Uh, things are still a little blurry, a little foggy for him, and uh, be in prayer that, that the Lord will continue to touch and heal his eye, and uh, that it will restore his his vision. All right. Still a lot of people sick, man, I tell you. Be in prayer for our, our church folks, our community, um, and, and those all around. Anybody else? Brother Tim. Brother Bill, uh, if you had recognized me, you be glad to see me back. So yes, I am. Thank you, Tim. Amen. Amen. Good deal. Thank you, Brother Tim, and it is good to have you and your family back, and and I uh, know that y'all have uh, several weeks, not just not just sickness, but uh, other other things as well, and and uh, glad to have you, but glad to have you all back. I tell you, uh, glad to be out of those thirties in Sunday school, Amen, and uh, good showing for that. Let's stand as we go to the Lord in prayer, and. Uh, after the prayer, I ask that you would remain standing for our pledge to the flags. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father God, what an awesome God you are. Again, we thank you for the day, Lord, that you've given to us. Another time and opportunity to come back into your house to, to lift up our voices, to lift up our hearts, Lord, to open up our minds for word, worship, praise, and prayer. Father, we thank you for all of the things that you've done for us. For those that were in Sunday school this morning, Lord, we praise your name for that. God, as we come together and worship, may we worship one heart and one mind, one voice. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Morning, y'all. All right, we're going to start off with the pledge to our American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And to our Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for his kingdom it stands, one brotherhood uniting all Christians in service and in love. And you may be seated. Our call to worship this morning is hymn number 644, or on the screen, Count Your Blessings. Next hymn is number 422, Surely Goodness and Mercy.
And our offertory hymn this morning is 485, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. You ladies all right got me on turn me up just a little bit please there we go 
I can hear me now. How is everybody? Good. It has been a long week, but it is sure good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Uh, thinking about that and thinking about the week that we have had and, and all that's going on and all that has happened, um, again, it, it is good to come back into the house of the Lord and um, to worship to pray, and to praise. It is good to come back in the house of the Lord at least for a little while. We can put the craziness of the world to the side. Amen. <laughs> it is good. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. As we are turning there, um, February Love, the, the, the month of love. Today is the 13th, tomorrow's the 14th, Valentine's Day, the day of love. So I thought, you know what, what better way than, uh, than to uh, start it off than by preaching a message from the book of love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's known as the love chapter. And uh, I've always, assuming that Paul wrote uh, the book of Hebrews, it's always uh, interesting when he's, sometimes he'll take and, and devote an entire chapter to a specific topic or a group. And um, Hebrews chapter 11, of course, is faith chapter. You read down through there and you see all the men and women of faith and, and uh, see their accomplishments and what they did uh, through the name of Christ. In this passage, Paul, he comes and he takes a little break and he says, let, let, let's talk about love just a little bit. And so Paul, he, he dedicates this entire chapter uh, to love, what love is, what love is all about. And uh, so we're going to take a little dive into it this morning and, and see, uh, see what Paul has to say about it from, uh, from a spiritual standpoint. I also want to say, and this is kind of a plug for Sunday night too, by the way, and we've been going through... Uh, our New Testament uh, teachings on Sunday night. And a couple of weeks ago, we started out with the one that we called Radical Love. And Radical Love, uh, even as the bulletin was talking about agape or, or Christian love or godly love. And that's, that's kind of what we're talking about. And, and every one of the teachings that we've used on Sunday night has kind of built off of that radical love, off of that Christian love. This morning, as we think about this uh, entire chapter have you ever stopped to think about how easy it is for people not to be totally honest about things? Uh, 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 to, to, I don't know. I'm not going to just say out and not lie because that would be another message for another day. But I'm, not talk, I'm talking about just kind of bend the truth a little bit. All right, let me explain it to you like this. Aditi and I, we've been married for quite some time. We got married in 1998. Do the math on that. It's a little over a long time. And... Um, <laughs> the other night at the steak dinner, they, they were going around, they were asking questions, and, and uh, they said, how many of you been married, five years, ten years, and then got on up to like 60 years, and then somebody asked, what if it feels like you've been married for 60 years? That may have been me. And uh, <laughs> anyway, got in trouble for that, but that's okay. Um, but, but here's the thing. Um, the, the, the amount of time that Dee and I, the amount of time that we've been married, she knows me. And, and, and I know her, amen, and that's the way it ought to be, get to know your spouse, get to know who they are. And um, she knows that one of the things that I don't particularly like to do is to go shopping. And I don't know I mean, going wandering around the mall, that's just not my thing, never has been. But she'll ask me when Gainesville, Valdez, or Jacksonville, whatever, do you want to go to the mall? Yeah, maybe that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> well, we say that, don't we? Why? Because we know that, that it'll make her happy. And, and so I do I do the dutiful thing, and I, and I follow her around from one store to the other, you know. And, I, and, and that's what we do. And was I telling the truth? Well, no. But um, <laughs> you got to be honest. But yet I was, because that's what she wanted to do. That's what we did. It's also kind of like when somebody asks, we were talking about this in Sunday school, I happened to think about it. When somebody asks, how are you doing? How many of you are going to say, well, my neck's been hurting real bad, and, and I've got this thing going down through my... 
You're going to say, I'm doing fine, thanks, how are you? And we, and we say that because we, we call it uh, uh, social graces or, or we call it playing nice. And I use that word playing because that's what it is. We're playing nice. We, we say the right things because that's what we're supposed to do. Doing the right things, but not necessarily for the right reasons. And, and that's where this whole concept of, of love is coming in. And that's the whole concept of, of, of what Paul is talking about. And Paul, he wants, to, he wants to change our thinking from, from doing the right thing or saying the right thing. But he wants us to do the right thing and say the right thing for the right reason. And there's, there's nothing, listen, if you're doing the right thing and saying the right thing for the wrong reason, keep doing and saying the right thing. Let's just change the motivation of the heart. Amen? And that's what Paul wants us to do. That's what, that's what he wants us to understand. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 22, in the second part of that from the New Living, it says, Love each other, how? Deeply. With what? All your heart. What Paul is telling us, what Peter is telling us here, and what Paul is telling us in the passage that we're about to look at, he says, listen, doing the right thing, saying the right thing, it's a good thing, but man, you've got to do it from your heart. You've got to do it from, from, from being a sincere, from, a, uh, from the right place with all of your heart, the right things for the right reason. And the biggest thing and the biggest reason for that, the biggest motivation, especially as a believer, amen, especially as a believer, that our main motivation, the reason that we ought to do the right thing for the right reason is because of our love for Christ. We're going to talk about it in a little while. But can you even begin? Now you hear me. Can you even begin? To wrap your head around the love that God had for us. Can you even begin to understand that? And the Bible says that's the kind of love that we're supposed to have. Not only towards our Lord, not only back towards Him, but for others as well. And Paul, he spends an entire chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He spends this entire chapter talking about what a radical love, what godly love looks like. Not only our love back toward him, but our love toward others. So, let's jump into this thing and see what happens. Love, first of all, is the key to ministry. As we open up and begin to look at this passage, notice what verse number 1 out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm using a lot of this from the New Living Translation this morning because I, I like the way that it reads in this passage. So, <clears throat> let's look at it. Paul, as he opens up the chapter, he simply says, again, this is the key to ministry. He says, if I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others. What does Paul say? He said, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He would just be out there making noise. It wouldn't mean anything. And in order to understand the value of love, in order to understand what we're talking about, we need to understand that love has to be the key. It has to be our motivation for our ministry. It has to be the underlying foundation for everything that we do. Our love for Christ has to be at the foundation. Has to be. When I stand up here and preach the word of God, when I stand up here and preach what the Lord has, has laid on my heart, I do it for several reasons. I do it firstly and primarily because I love my Lord. Amen? I do it because He's called me to do it. I do it because I love Him. I want to be obedient to Him. And I do it because I love you as well. Amen? I do. Now, it's not always easy. Man, I, I promise you, it's not always easy. But I do it out of love for Him. I do it with a pure heart. I do it with a clean heart. God's called me to a service for Him. And it's what I do to honor Him. Sad truth is, there's a lot that that's not the case. There's, there, there, there's, there's, there's some, and I know people. I know people, I'm sure that you know people as well, who 
do things for others, not for the good of them, but for the good of themselves. They, 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 they put themselves out there for what they get out of it. They put themselves out there for, for what they get in, to, in return. I, I hate to even say this, but, but it's also the truth that I know of pastors, I know of men who stand in the pulpit. I'm careful not to call them preachers, or uh, um, they're preachers. I'm careful not to call them pastors. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Got to be careful. There, there are men who are standing in pulpits today who are doing what they do not out of a heart of love. And, I, and I've seen some even standing in the pulpit doing it out of, out, out of hate, out of, out of maliciousness. They, they've used the pulpit as a battering ram. Well, you ought to be careful of that. You, if you stand in the pulpit, you're representing God. Can we say amen to that? When you stand before your Sunday school class and you teach your class, you're standing to represent our Lord and Savior. We need to be very careful when we stand and teach and preach the Word of God. That we're doing it out of a heart of love and not out of a heart of maliciousness. And you might stand here and say this morning, Brother Bill, that's crazy. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. It is. You say it should never happen. I say that you're right. It should never happen, but it does. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, it's nothing that's happened that's new. You go back to the time of Christ, you can see it happening there as well. Who was it that gave Jesus the most trouble? Who was it that gave Jesus the most problems back in the day? It was the religious leaders. They were the one who got so mad with him. They were the one that got so aggravated with him. Boy, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. As we keep on looking, look at verse number 2, second, or 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul comes back again. Key is, or love is key to our, our, our ministry. Paul comes back and he says, if I had the gift of prophecy. Paul says, if I understood all, the, all of God's secret plans. Boy, wouldn't that be great. Amen. Lord, what in the world are you up to? Oh. All of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge. If I had such faith. <coughs> if I had such faith that I could move mountains. And then Paul said, if I didn't love others. He said, I'd be nothing. Boy, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if, if we had the gift of prophecy? Wouldn't that be pretty awesome? That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? But I mean, what's going to happen? Well, let me tell you what's going to happen. Wouldn't it be great if we, hey, can we say amen to this? Wouldn't it be great if we understood all of God's secret plans? How many have ever asked the question, Lord, why? Be honest with yourself. We have, haven't we? Lord, why? Well, wouldn't it be great if we had the answer to that? We possessed all knowledge. Now, I know that there's some people out there that think they know it all. And then there's folks like me that do. And no, I don't. But wouldn't that be pretty cool if we had all the knowledge? Somebody asks you a question, you answer them. Boom, there it is. But what good would it be, honestly? What good would it be if we didn't have love for other people? Honestly. What, what would it... And, and Paul, he, he asked the question right. He asked the question right. It, it doesn't matter how much head knowledge you have. It doesn't matter even how much faith you have because he said right there, if I had faith that I could move a mountain, but I didn't have love. He said it would be meaningless. It, it, it wouldn't mean anything. <clears throat> Paul, can, can we ask the question like this? If, let's just say that, Paul, you had the gift of prophecy. Paul, let's just say that, that you did understand all the secrets of God. Uh, Paul, let's just say that you knew everything that there was to know. What are you doing with that knowledge? Well, what is it benefiting you? And if you're not using it to help others, Paul, what if you did have the faith that you could move them out? What are you using 
that to benefit the kingdom of heaven? What are you doing to push the cause of Christ forward? Let's ask it that way. And by the way, that word nothing there, it literally means absolute zero. Keep in mind, knowledge is a great thing to have. Can we say amen to that? It is a great thing to have. And we ought to study the Word of God. Scripture even tells us that you need to study the Word of God. We ought, to, we ought to read the Bible. We ought to study the Bible. Memorize Scripture. As you're driving down the road, man, you, those verses have come back to mind. It's good to know these things. But it's also more important to love God and to love others. So we get to verse number 3. <clears throat> Paul comes back and he says, If I gave everything I have to the poor and, and even sacrificed my body, Paul says, I could brag about it. I could pat myself on the back about it. But he said, if I didn't love others, they said, what would it be the benefit? What, what has it gained me? What, what would be the purpose of it? I said in the beginning of this message that there are, there are some who are doing the right things, but they're doing it for the wrong reasons. They, they, they may do it out of guilt. They may do it out of obligation. They may do it for, for whatever reason. But I'm going to come back and I'm going to tell you this. The only reason, the only right reason is because God gave us his son, because God showed us his love first. I asked you a while ago, can you even begin to imagine? Can you even begin to understand the depth of love that God had for us? Now with that, I'm going to show you a verse of scripture. That every one of us probably knows. That every one of us, <clears throat> probably the ver first verse you ever memorized. John chapter 3 and verse number 16. What does the verse say? For God so loved. There's that word. Loved. It's a love that, that. Paul says it's almost indescribable. It's a love that, that, that we have a hard time wrapping our heads around. The Bible tells us that, that while we were yet sinners, that, that Christ loved us. While we, were still, while we had nothing to do with God, while we were doing our own thing, while we were on the road to hell wide open, full throttle, the Bible says that God loved us. And he poured out his blood. He poured out his spirit for us. And he went to the cross and he died for us. Why? For the chance that we might accept him and be saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the whoever, and I like that word, amen? It don't matter. It goes beyond any race, creed, background, culture. It doesn't matter. The Bible says that whoever believes in him will find everlasting life, will have everlasting life. And it says will not perish. It says will not die. I had, did a... I did a funeral for uh, for the first boss I ever had this past week, Randolph Michael. Sixteen years of age, working work for Michael's party. Did, did his funeral this past week. In that message, I said this, as I've said in a couple of others as well. Death in its truest sense means eternal separation. Death in its truest sense means eternal separation. 
And the Bible says, for those that believe in Christ, for those that believe in Jesus, will never perish, will never die, will never experience death, will never experience separation, will never be separated from the things of God, but have everlasting life, will be forever joined with Him. And the Bible says, Paul tells us that when we die in Christ, when we die as believers, to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. Can we say amen to that? The Bible says that as believers, when you die, you will not experience death. You will not experience that separation, but have that everlasting, that eternal life that is promised to us. And that life... And that love, the life that he gave for us, that love that he had for us, and the love that we return to him as believers, as following him and, and, and following his commands and doing what he's asked, it brings us to the key of our relationships. That love is the key to those relationships. I want to skip out of uh, 13 for just a second and go to chapter, chapter 8. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, in the first verse, in the last part of that first verse, it says, but while... Knowledge makes us feel important. It is the love. It is love that strengthens the church. Can we say amen to that? Let me tell you something, Christian. One thing that God wants in, in, in the fellowship of his believers is unity. The one thing that God wants, that Christ wants in the fellowship of his believers is for us to get along to be, as I said even in my prayer this morning, of one body, of one mind. To come together as a unit, to come together as a body, working together. And I can promise you the only way, you hear me when I tell you this, the only way that can happen is by the love of God. Amen? Simple put, by the love of God. talk about our relationship and talk about love. We talk about the difference between godly love and the world's love. I can go ahead and tell you this straight up this morning that the world's love has conditions. Amen? And we see that. And we know that to be true. And the world says that, that I will love you as long as I can get something out of you. The world says that I will love you as long as it benefits me. The world says, I will love you as long as you're easy to love. How about that one? God's love is unconditional. Romans 5, 8, we talked about it a while ago. While we were still in our sins, while we were still enemies of God, God still showed his love for us. You don't know what godly love looks like? You want to know what this love that Paul is talking about? You want to know what it looks like? He spends the next couple of verses explaining it to us. He said, love is patient and kind. Amen? He said that love is patient and kind. He said that love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude doesn't demand its own way, it's not irritable, keeps no record of being wronged. How about that? The idea behind godly love gives us the ability to be wronged and not retaliate. Christian love doesn't repay evil for evil, but with goodness and kindness. That's a hard concept to learn. Amen. We've been conditioned. We've been taught by the world that when someone wrongs you, I get to wrong you back. That's our thoughts. That's the flesh thought. Amen. You wrong me, I get to wrong you back. But God said that ain't the way it ought to be. God says if somebody wrongs you, you let me deal with it. <laughs> Ooh. That ought to be a scary thought to us, amen? Yeah, you'd probably rather have me punish you than the Lord punish you, I'm just saying. <laughs> you ever been to God's woodshed? Yeah. <laughs> the love that we're supposed to have is not jealous. Let me tell you something, we've been blessed, Amen. 
We've been blessed in so many ways, and let's just be honest, some people are, are, are more blessed than others, and, and it's our job to be happy for them, not to be jealous of them. As a Christian, we should be happy. We should not envy them. God's love is, is not boastful. It doesn't go around bragging about itself. It means that we're not to be prideful. The book of Daniel. I love that book. There was a king there called uh, by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Y'all remember him? Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't learn this lesson about love and pride and boastfulness. Well, he did, but not, not at first. It, it was a hard lesson. For, it, it was a seven-year process for him to learn that lesson. King Nebuchadnezzar, he stood up on the city walls, and he said, Look how good I am. Look how great I am. Look at this city. Look at these walls. Man, look how great I am. And the Lord said, I got, a, I got a solution for that. And he spent the next years in the field, seven years actually, in the field eating grass. <laughs> yeah, that was a sight to see. It's not boastful. It's not rude. Love never acts out of character. Never acts out of place. Christian love, godly love means that we should become all things to all people for the honor of God. This kind of love that we're talking about this morning is it's not self-centered. This kind of love that we're talking about this morning, it does not demand its own way. And I'll even add this one to it. The kind of love that we're talking about this morning, it doesn't wear a holy chip on its shoulder daring somebody to knock it off. Amen. It doesn't go around with the head held so high and, and, and you telling people how holy and, and how great you are that if it were to rain, you'd drown. You understand what I mean? It, it's a humble kind of love. It's a Christian love, not to be a doormat either, but to stand on the authority, to stand on the promises of God, to stand on the truth of what the Word has to tell us. Christian love never has or keeps a revengeful record. The argument that y'all had six months ago, the argument that y'all had, the argument that y'all had on your date night, let it go. Amen. It's in the past. You know, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, we're going to actually talk about forgiveness tonight in our New Testament uh, teachings. So y'all come back and I'll, and I'll hit that one again. But let me tell you something, it doesn't keep that revengeful record. I want to do a real quick survey. Y'all got to be honest with me, just, just for a second. You be honest with me. How many of you have ever been upset at somebody but couldn't remember why? <laughs> you know what I'm I don't like that person, but I don't remember why. <laughs> Dude, let it go. I mean, good gracious. <laughs> Love's not easily moved to anger. It doesn't. It doesn't plot evil revenge. Love's the opposite of hate. It's the opposite of evil. And there's no way that you can say that you have love in your heart when you harbor and hate as well. <clears throat> Go back to our focal passage in verse number 6. Paul says that love does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. It takes no pleasure in stirring up troubles. It takes no joy when sin wins out of righteousness. But when truth and righteousness, when it has the victory, when the guys in the white hat win, amen, then love gains the victory. Verse number seven, love never gives up. Can we say amen right there? Man, you look around our world today, and I'm being straight up and honest as I can be. They, 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 they look at love as, as something that comes and goes. Man, love's more than emotion. Man, love is love is an attitude. Amen. Love, it doesn't give up. 
It never loses faith. It's always hopeful. It endures through, through every circumstance. Man, it gets in there and it fights the battles. God's, God's love, it, 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 it covers faults and it covers the failures of others. The idea is not that the love puts up with anything and everything. That's not what we're talking about here. But it works to forgive the flaws of others rather than rather than, than, than pointing them out. Let me, let me show you this passage in First Peter, in First Peter chapter four, and verse number eight. It says, most important of all. What, what does Peter say here? He says, continue to show deep love for each other. Why? For love covers a multitude of sins. And we need to understand what it's talking about. We need to understand what this is saying. What it's saying is, is Paul is not saying that, that it, we ought to conceal the truth. We ought not to conceal the sins of others. I mean, those sins, they have to be dealt with. Again, we're going to talk about that tonight. But Christian love stands by the person as they walk through the valley of it. Amen? Brother, sister, I see that you're going through a hard time. I see that you got some things in your life that ought not to be. Let me walk with you through this. Don't let me just walk on you. Don't let me throw you under the bus. Don't let me back over you and pull forward a few times going, yep, there's somebody there. That ain't what Christian love is about. The Bible says that we as believers, we ought to come to the body of Christ to be lifted up, not to be run over. Paul, he says that, 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 that this love, it walks with us. Christian love. Stands by. It talks about love believes all things. Now listen. Have you ever known anybody that was just gullible? However, if you tell me that the sky is green, I'm probably going to walk out there and look. It's not what it's talking about, about love believes all things. It's, 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 not, it's not a blanket thing. But what it means is, is that love is going to try to find the best in people. It's going to look for that good. It's going to look for, it's going to look for that, the, the, those positive characteristics of a person's life. And, I, and I can, let me add this to it as well. Let me tell you something, folks. You don't ever know what another person is going through. Amen? You don't ever know. I mean, when you see somebody, you, you don't, you don't, you don't know what's happened to them over the, over the past 24 hours, 48 hours, week. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what happened to, their, to them in the last 30 minutes. You don't know. Look for that good. Look for that positive. We were talking about this this morning. If, if you ask somebody how they're doing and, and they start talking about their neck pain and back pain and, and their kidneys hurt and their big toe and, and the hangnail that they had four years ago, I mean, just listen. Just listen. Amen. You'll never know. Show that you care. God's love, it stays strong. Fourth and final is the key to our victory. Look at verses 8 through 10. Prophecy and speaking in unknown, langu unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. Paul says, but what? Love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. Even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole. But when full understanding comes, these partial things will become useless. Talking about our victory, Paul wants us to understand that the things of earth were going to come day or, or one day going to come to an end. We can say amen right there. And, 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 and if you watch the evening, man, it's coming quick. It's coming quick. 
All of these things are going to come to an end. All of the knowledge, all of the things that we possess, all of the things that we put all of this value in is one day is going to be gone. But the love of God, that godly love, is going to last. And the Bible says it's going to last forever. Can we say amen to that? I want to I want to skip over that. I want to go to that last verse. Beautiful, beautiful verse. And 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 Paul in in this last verse he said three things is going to last forever. And he talks about faith and love, or faith and hope first. And we talk about faith and we and we understand how important faith is and we understand that 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 it was our faith that that brought us to the point of salvation to begin with. The Bible says that it was our faith that, that taught us to understand that we were sinners and that we needed God's love to begin with. The Bible says that it is our faith that, that, that we believed in Christ and believed what he did on the cross for us. It is that faith that we build our relationship with him on. The second thing he talks about is hope. And as Christians, as believers, we have a hope in our Christ. We have a hope in our Lord. We have a hope in, in our Savior. And, and the hope is not a, man, I hope so. But the hope is a knowing hope. It's an assurance of hope. It is something that we know for sure. And Paul says there's three things that's going to last forever. Faith is going to last. Hope is always going to be there. And man, I can tell you, we'll, we'll go to the other side of that coin for just a second. When you meet somebody who has no hope, you've met a broken person. Amen? And, and I'm sure that all of us have countered somewhere, somewhere along in our, in our lifetime, somebody who has lost hope. And you see the despair in their eyes, and you see the pain in their eyes, and, and you can feel their hurt. Paul says we haven't lost hope. And then, he, and then he says love. He says that love is going to last forever. And it's not just God's love. It's not just his love towards us. But Paul is saying our love towards him. Our love towards other people. Our love to invite somebody to church. Our love to, to encourage them to, to be in God's house. To encourage them to be around other Christians. And then Paul closes the chapter with a very interesting phrase. He says, as important as faith is, and it's important, amen? Again, it's the foundation to our salvation. God's grace, our faith. Foundation to our salvation. He said, there's something more important than that faith. And then he says, hope. As important as hope is. Hope is what gives us the ability to get out of bed every morning and put one foot in front of the other. That's what hope is. Amen? That's what hope is. As important as faith is. As important as... As hope is, Paul says there's something even more important, and that's love. Paul spent this entire chapter talking about Christian, godly love. And tomorrow's Valentine's Day. Tomorrow's the day to, that, that we focus on our love to our spouse, our children, our family. All the Valentine's Day has to offer. But Valentine's Day is going to be celebrated by believers and non-believers alike. For us as believers, let's not just celebrate Valentine's Day, the day of love. But let's also use that to remember the love of God and the love that he had for us and the reason 
that we're sitting in worship today. Father, we thank you for the day and the hour that you've given to us, Lord, for this time to come into your house and again to worship you, to talk about your love, to talk about the things that you have done for us. Lord, to look at your scriptures, to look at your word. Lord, today, as we close out, may we never forget the love that you've had for us. The things that you've done for us. The directions you've taken us. The people that you've put in our path. Father, that we can show your love to them. Lord, today, let us never forget your love. In Jesus' name, amen.